Oh, and good weekend, everybody. Hello, Val. Hey, Spent Death. Hey, Lurkers. Hey, Raging Pseudo. It feels like forever since I've seen you guys. We Hello. did it. We made it. We made it to the show. Lights. See the difference a little bit of broadcast lighting makes? Look at that. It's beautiful now. It's true. Can confirm. Lighting real good. Yep. I've got a switch on the wall there. And I've got a switch on the wall there. And they both control the plug that all of my lights for my broadcast are into. I love the setup. If I ever forget, I can just like reach past my desk and go poke. Everything. And then it all turns on. Instantly. That's Remember awesome. before I used to see me reaching all over the place, flicking switches and stuff? Never again! It's beautiful. I can't touch the <laughs> darkness inside you with all this light. Is it, so, isn't it the uh, the Chosen Undead that's supposed to be doing the darkness touching, Val? Okay, I, I killed the darkness inside me with all that salt. <laughs> Oh, hey, this is totally the wrong thing. There we go. I forgot I had band camp for Dance with the Dead up! Because I was pimping some Dance with the Dead while you guys were rebooting. Spent was like, hey, this is pretty good. And I was like, fucking rights, it's pretty good. It's Dance with the Dead. So I linked their band camp. Go check out Dance with the Dead. They do all of our intro music, our exit music. Anytime you hear music playing during a game, that isn't the game. Anytime you hear music in a Be Right Back screen, it's all Dance with the Dead because we love Dance with the Dead, and because they're fantastic people who allow creatives to use their work. Yeah, I was going to say, that's that's another one of the amazing things about the band, because they're self-published. <laughs> they just said, you know, as long as you're not promoting hate, and as long as you credit us for the music that's going on on the stream, go ahead, use the music. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We've at least got a couple people here, and Val streams. So I'm sure he's heard some stupid stuff <laughs> about game engines in his day. Things you've heard. Give it to us. Let's start with all the stupid stuff you've ever heard somebody say about a game engine. Give us every dumb thing you've ever heard so that we can tell you if it was actually accurate. Also from I mean, you guys. Um, so I'll start. I'll throw some of my favorites out there. All right. One of my absolute favorites was the game engine used on this SNES game. I'm going to paraphrase it a bit to get it down into the thing. But yeah, Retro Streamer was playing SNES games and Buddy was like, wasn't this game made on the same engine as other game? Like, yes, they were. The engine the is called Super the Nintendo. SNES. <laughs> <laughs> Games of that era didn't didn't have game engines. Um, the console was was quite literally a game engine and, and you made your game in the in the console's game engine. That was that was how that worked. They gave you very very specific tools that you could use. The the one that frustrates me is that engine x can't do thing y that's that's the one that really frustrates me and a lot of people do this with unity specifically oh my display is gone oh it's back um the uh the complaints about unity being unable to do 3d like <laughs> no it's 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 perfectly fine at 3d it's great at 3d you just don't know how to do it yeah, you see that a lot with, with most game engines. If there's any part of the game engine that they're not strong at, then, or if it's not, you know, if there's any other engine that just does it better, instead of being like, oh, you know, Engine Z does this better, it's Engine X can't do this and only Engine Z can, which is what you see a lot with the three kind of very popular ones right now, which is Unreal, Unity, and Godot. And uh, like, it's kind of like Godot's 3D isn't like that great there are some issues with it but it's not you know impossible <coughs> like you can like i've been working on a 3d game in godot it's just not as streamlined and optimized as the other engines but it doesn't mean you can't do it and a big thing with that too is 
a lot of times it's because you know no one's done it yet doesn't mean it can't be done because with that thinking then it'll never be done right it's yeah just it's because it hasn't been done yet doesn't mean it's not possible it just means it hasn't been done yet these are it's new tech right no one's the, gotten around to, to doing it the better way to say it and the proper way to say it is that godot's 3d is less mature yeah that's, it just that's hasn't the way had to the say time. it yeah if you were to pull the components apart and look at how it's done and build your own 3d in godot it would work just as well as any others so it's possible <laughs> Sorry, Sven. Nope. Nope, not true. Not true, Spent. Uh, JS is more than capable of doing it. Uh, we got most of the way there before a uh, guy, mastermind behind it, the architect, had to go do something else, but we totally had a real-time multiplayer engine in JS where two people could play head-to-head -head and in pretty real-time watch uh, each other's turns happening. It was pretty cool. The only reason it had to go on backhold is that there's a lot of edge cases you have to account for when doing netcode that cause crashes that have to be accounted for, so there's just you know, a metric ton of error pro error handling to be done. <laughs> Literal metric ton of error handling. And JavaScript is not a bad language. No. It's it's not. It's a perfectly fine language. It just allows you to shoot yourself in the foot really easily. It's like saying C is bad because you can blow your feet off with it. It's just not true. I've, I've made a game engine in, in WebGL and with JavaScript and the, j just trying to do that level of architecture programming it's it's a, it's a bit wild and it's a bit kind of like yeah this probably wasn't the intention when this language was created so it is kind of it is kind of wild um and it makes things a lot more complicated than they probably need to be but at the, at the end of the day you can still do it it's just you have to be more careful um yeah yeah that's, that's where like that's the key is careful it's kind of nice for for that kind of level of programming even though it's kind of a um, you can add a bit of bloat and it's not always necessary. It is nice to force yourself into some constraints in that way because when you're working with a lot of memory management and data management, you need to make sure that things are the things that they are. Um, so if you're, if you're making it in WebGL, maybe take a look at, at TypeScript and see if you can set it up with that. Um, and then maybe looking at a, a, a kind of how much you can just offload and use um, existing WebGL libraries or how much you can just you know leverage that stuff and there's already a lot of environments for for debugging that you can kind of hook into as well um i'll, I'll look into some some tools um for you and i'll post them in our discord there's a bunch of game engine development tools that you can use especially for stuff around like shaders um, helping you debug and um debug your shaders because that's kind of a nightmare in webgl is trying to debug shaders but there's other programs that you can do where you just dump in your shader and it'll allow you to kind of break down each thing and kind of help you identify what might be going wrong and as, as far as type safety, that's just preference. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm a big type safety guy myself. Rage, Rage will attest to this. I am always defending type safety. <laughs> because the larger the team, the, the more important it becomes. <laughs> but if you want to talk pure perfection, where every developer never makes a single logical mistake Ever in their design and in working with each other's pieces type safety isn't technically needed type safety is there to catch a lot of errors that people the, are going specifically to make. <laughs> when when you're working in a browser specifically like it will add a lot of, a lot of complexity and a lot of additional overhead to what you're doing uh, which can really slow you down, especially if what you're doing isn't already covered by a type library. Uh, this is something that specifically I've run into uh, embedding a couple of different view libraries together. Uh, like one of the jobs that I was doing, I was working on getting React components and web components to render inside like seven different versions of Angular. 
and the only way I could get that translation to work was by ignoring all of the types because otherwise I would have had to do like seven or eight different overloads per version of Angular based on what kind of node was being passed in. Yeah, there's absolutely a reason we use uh, high functioning non-type languages for front ends and web and stuff like that. And But there is absolutely a reason why we use low level typed languages for the base memory management and function with the computer. So they both have an essential place. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And there we go. See, don't delete those messages. Those messages are important. That creates conversation. Points to make. Someone beside me getting timed out. Am I in Bizarro World? See, now you can time Val out so he doesn't feel left out. Okay, sure. There you go. See, that's how you yeah. get it out of you. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I went. I went. To, I was gonna do it, and then <laughs> Rage did it and moved the chat up, and then I almost banned. <laughs> accidentally banned someone. Almost again. banned. Spent. <laughs> I was gonna not ever touch that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, now that everyone's included, is there any other uh, ridiculous things you'd like to add? Yeah, I've got, I've got a list because I've been using a lot of game engines. <laughs> um, game engines are cheating. Game engines Hold are... Hold on, let me, let me get the share up so you can actually... Uh, sure, that'll, that'll help. Put them on there. I'm starting to actually wake up, which is nice. Brain yeah, is good morning, Pseudo. On. Yeah, fucking, fucking Tarkov. I was playing <laughs> Zelo to like 6 or 7 in the morning. Doing requests and, and shit. I, a clip I posted, <laughs> that guy scared the absolute shit out of me. I don't know what it is. I think Discord's like muting my other audio because I did not hear him coming. And then I, for some reason, he didn't hear me. And he just like ran into me and I just held down the mouse button. And, <laughs> and I just... he didn't even hit me. Like he didn't even shoot me. He just like died. And I'm lucky that he wasn't paying attention because if it was someone like Rage who has like really good target acquisition, I would have just turned a corner and some dude would have ran up to me and shot me in the face. I would have been like, <laughs> <"Fuck this game." laughs> I'm lucky that that guy was probably as startled as I was because I was, uh, <laughs> I was crouch walking because I wasn't making any noise. And then he just <laughs> like, <"Wah." laughs> it's dark. I turned the left. This dude's just barreling up the stairs. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> and also, also probably. <coughs> Excuse me. Just as tired as you were, so yeah. the reflexes weren't there. <laughs> yeah, I was doing the. I was in a quest spot, so that dude was probably just running up to do his quest, and he's probably like, "Ah, no one's questing at fucking five or six o'clock in the morning." And then all of a sudden, "Hello, welcome to AK Land." <laughs> <laughs> Population you. <laughs> there you go. Okay, thank you. I have a document share. Ow. Okay, let me yeah, that nice that Doom guy crotch it. shot is because you're only seeing a piece of my desktop with the little window capture. Okay. Using a game engine is cheating. All right, we can address this one. Yeah, Let the pros lot. cover what the pros are good at so that you can focus on what you want to do. Make a game, not program a 3D physical world. There's a big difference. There's a reason that there's all this architecture there so that you can make a goddamn game. Yeah, and this is something that I was guilty of as well when I first started. And it's and something that's very common. I'm pretty the, sure uh, everyone starts that thought potter process. Yeah. <gasps> I want to yeah. do it all. It's especially, it's kind of just that, because I want to make sure I, I don't mess up this terminology. Um... Yeah, it's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Oh yeah, for the Dunning-Kruger effect is strong. Yeah, I always, I, for some reason, I always mix it up with the Doppler effect. <laughs> yeah, the Doppler, Doppler effect quite is a the same very thing. different yeah, thing. Yeah, so I want to make sure, making sure it's the right thing. For, for um, those that are watching, if you're wondering, well, what the hell's the Doppler effect then? That's when you hear a siren coming at you and it pitch shifts as it approaches and then leaves you because the wave of the... The audio wave is traveling at different speeds because of its projection point traveling at different speeds relative to you. 
A yeah, better question would be when should you write your own game engine? Uh, when you have a large team. Um, or if it, you just want to experiment and you want to do it on an academic level because you want to understand how all the little nitty gritty pieces work inside of the engine, it's wonderful to make your own simple engine. Make your own simple 2D draw engine so that you understand how the computer writes to the video memory and how that all works. Then do a very simple 3D draw engine that you can plug in there that does all of the pipeline of calculation for taking your position, taking world positions, creating a viewpoint, all that fun stuff. The basic math can be done simply. You're not going to get a super high performance engine. You're not going to do all the fancy 3D stuff, but you're going to understand what you're asking the engine to do when you go to use the professional engine. So when should you write your own? When you're curious. Yeah, I, that's that's a good way to say that. I, I agree. There's a lot to learn by doing a, a, a small version of a thing yourself. And then just go back to using the library because the library is tested and proven. Yeah, so yeah. I, I would never, ever, ever write my own library for anything that I'm going to be using a, a, ch a majority chunk of the library of just because there's more people with bigger brains than me that have specialized in doing exactly what this library does that have worked on it. And there's no conceivable way that I'm going to make a better one than they have. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's I'm just gonna not going to happen. Address three and then four. So using a game engine is cheating. Is something that, like, like we were saying, like, it always kind of starts and kind of like the Dunning-Kruger effect is when you first start off, you don't know as much as you think you do. And it's kind of like once you know, when you kind of figure out how much knowledge you're actually missing is when you kind of have an understanding of the how much a game engine actually does and how much work they are. Um, so at the start, it's kind of just like, you know, I want to make a game. I don't want to just, you know, click buttons in a software to make a game. That doesn't seem like game making when really that is game making. Game making isn't really programming. Um, game development is actually much different than programming and game programming is kind of really kind of weird compared to just traditional and other kinds of programming um but it's kind of something that you find a lot with people that first start out and maybe haven't even used a game engine before maybe they tried using a game engine and it was kind of weird to them so then they'll just kind of say well screw game engines you know i'm gonna write my own and make my game that way um and it's not cheating i mean whatever you use to make a game is making a game it doesn't matter if you're using unreal and using c plus plus it doesn't matter if you're using unreal and using blueprints it doesn't matter if you're using game maker doesn't matter if you're using construct which has no code as long as you make a game and it's something you can play and, and enjoy it's you're making a game it's not cheating it's that's not the point there's no like there's you're not cheating it out it, it's the whole point is just to make a game if you, you know you make a game then there you go it doesn't matter how really it was done whether you spent six months writing an engine from scratch to make a a basic 3d platformer or you did that in a weekend with unity it's you know it's whatever you wanted to get out of it and then the other one of never writing your own game engine this kind of goes both ways you hear a lot of people saying you know you should always make your own always make your own engine framework for the pro project you need and then there's people saying that you should never write your own engine and for the most part depending on the skill level you should never write your own engine but i do highly recommend that anyone who's interested in game development at least try making their own once just for educational purposes just because you'll touch on all the various like areas that's um, involved in a game engine and it kind of gives you that understanding and that low level things of kind of what's happening under the hood and it kind of helps you in your process for making games of like what limitations are there and why certain things happen the way they do and kind of just a base level understanding um, there is a there is a book which the third edition is out now it's game engine architecture by Jason Gregory um, I have and read this second edition which I really enjoyed it really breaks everything down very nice kind of diagrams of what's all in a game engine as well as a lot of real world examples it goes through a lot of kind of naughty dog games and all the various levels that goes to them and kind of how complicated these game engines get at a uh, triple a studio level but also just kind of what's needed for even just 2d and kind of smaller scoped games um, other than that if a person has a skill set and they're confident in it, they know how to make their own game engine and they have a game idea that 
you know, maybe they need really good performance for, or maybe it's a very niche idea and the kind of Swiss Army Knife game engines aren't going to cut it, then they can make their own. But at that point, that person wouldn't really have to ask the question because they'd have the abilities and the knowledge to know when to make that decision. And it's kind of just, you need to be able to identify the limitations of the game engines and know what they're missing. And then knowing that you have the skill set yourself to create what they're missing. And that's going to be quite a rare case, but there are some edge cases for that. And that would be certain things like, you know, if you wanted to make like a browser MMO of some certain caliber, or you wanted to do some kind of really special graphical trick or some really kind of neat engine. Like I think if you wanted to do like some 4D stuff, I don't know how well current game engines can handle that. Or if you wanted to do some, like there's some really niche, really weird things that you can do when you get into game making and um, world building that traditional engines may not support right out of the box, especially if you don't have source access. So sometimes, you know, you might want to do that. I'm, I can't remember, um, including in, including space, I think is some of the engines that are kind of cool, but I think unity can handle that stuff now, but there's a lot of really cool stuff where you're like, I don't want to do traditional 3d, you know, I want to have, you know, throw some 40 in there. I want to be able to make like a simulation that, you know, we really kind of mess with time and, you know, you got to, like at that point, you know, that's very advanced. So you kind of have the understanding and knowledge of how to do a game engine. But I also think that you should, if you're interested in game making, at least try making some basic ones as well. Even if it's like a 2D one in, in whatever language or WebGL, um, it's a kind of a good one to start as well because it's, you can kind of dive into it. It gets a bit funky, but there's some good books out there, some good tutorials, even just to get something moving across the screen. It'll give you a much greater appreciation and understanding for the engines that are out there. Yep. I just grabbed some YouTube tutorials just to understand that like, I'm not, I, I knew how to program already when I was doing this. So I wasn't, you know, as I'm watching, I'm like, Ooh, yeah, that's, that's some funky, some funky stuff you're doing there. But I understood the, the pieces that he was creating and how they were talking to each other. And that was kind of what I was getting out of it. It was, it was good. I wouldn't recommend him to, to a random person. Cause I wouldn't recommend doing some of the things he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I have, I'll uh, spend death if you message me on Discord. I have a book on WebGL game engine creation, uh, and I can send you the name of it um, if you want. I think there's an online version of it too, and that's what I use to make mine. It might be a bit outdated, but there might be some info in there that you can reference that might help out on how they build certain things. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, using a game engine isn't cheating. And of course, you should write your own engine sometimes. But even just because you're a AAA studio doesn't mean you should write your own engine. Um, Ace Combat 7. What a wonderful game. Built in Unreal. Oh yeah, this is this is a good one that uh, that Sudo just added. That game engines are expensive, and one of the things that is interesting about this one is that it used to be true. It used to be a true statement to say that game engines are expensive because you had to license them, and it was tens of thousands of dollars per seat. Uh, but now all of the big engines have some way for small studios to use them, and there'll be you know some sort of rev share after a certain amount of profit is made or something like that and it's really lowered the barrier to entry as far as as far as using those tools i found the new price points rather reasonable uh, uh, like a uh, yeah the big thing about them is it's usually tiered um i think unreal just moved to this as well not too long ago but originally i think i think uni was the first one to do that where it's like you, there's no cut until I think either a hundred thousand dollars or a million. I can't remember. I what think they, it's a what million dollars. You no. make a million dollars, then you need to pay for it. Yeah. And I think, yeah, cause I think originally it was a hundred thousand and then they bumped it up more because, um, they basically get advertisement because with a lot of Unity games, you kind of are, you, you can kind of tell when th there's a certain part of game development when you get there, um, where you can kind of understand, like you'll start to realize the kind of niches and limitations that certain engines have and things of like the kind of collision that they're using default collision and stuff like that but 
like Unity is very solid, but there's a lot of games where I'll play and I can kind of tell right at the game, like, oh, I think this is a Unity game, and then I'll Google it, like, what game engine does this game use? Oh, it uses Unity. Like, well, that's great. So they get a lot of advertisement out of, you know, having a lot of games made in their engine and it makes it, you know, adds a lot of legitimacy to it. And then the nice thing is, is that if your game does really well and you're making, you know, a million dollars or a couple million dollars, at that point, you should, you know, have it in your budget to be able to pay for the software that allowed your game to be possible. So I think it's a very reasonable approach for them to take. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. Once you've made a million dollars on your game, then yeah, the the people that gave you this amazing set of tools to make your game probably deserve some kickback at that point. They because if if once you understand what really goes into them, you'll agree. The people that made it, thanks guys, thanks. <laughs> Just remember, Epic used to be borderline tyrannical about outside studios using their engine. Yeah, well, it is an IP. And, uh, you know, that's that's sure, how they we'll make their money. It, but we're not going to tell you how. Not nearly as bad as Crytek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've yeah. super protected their secrets with Crytek, and look what happened because of it. Nobody knew how to use it. Nobody could make good games on it. Nobody paid attention to it anymore. And they didn't sell any copies. And because they weren't making any more Crisis Tech demos, uh, they didn't really go anywhere. Maybe if they let more people use it, it would have been more popular. Yeah, and one last thing I want to touch on for expensive is I see a lot of people trying, even people who are first starting out, trying to pick their engines based on what their eventual price is and... Honestly, just just don't worry about that, especially if you're making your first game, um, especially with the generosity of how much they're making. If you're making millions of dollars, like you should, there's going to be a lot of costs when you're getting into that level of game making, um, especially when you figure out how much of a cut distributors take. If you're uploading to Steam, you're going to be paying like 30% to Steam on per sale. If you're uploading to Epic and a few other stories, you're probably looking at about 8 to 12% um, of stuff like that too. So. Even if you're making millions of dollars, you're still going to be, like, profit-wise on games, you're still looking at about 30 to 40 to 50 percent after, especially when you're factoring in, you know, taxes. Um, when you start factoring it, you have to advertise and, you know, maintaining stuff and depending on what your game is. So it's not going to be 100 percent profit. And so don't, like, don't be afraid to, you know, pay for the stuff you're using. It's kind of just how business works and kind of how this stuff works. Um, and don't go with you know this free engine you've never heard of just because you want to save some money in the future in case your game makes it i would more worry about making the easier tools to making a good game and then capitalizing off that success later i mean if you're making a million dollars off a game that is amazing that's better than you know a lot of established indie developers have even come close to doing so it's what we call a success problem yeah don't don't let that limit you don't worry about losing like 10 or 20 or fifty thousand dollars to like a licensing fee when you're making millions off a game with a small studio so just use the engines don't let that limit at you don't make the harder for you because you're trying to you know squeeze on every penny um but i mean it's up it's up to the person that's just my recommendation don't 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 worry about it until it's a success problem and then your next game if you if it's that much of a problem then your next game you can you know write your own engine if you really want to have all the profit or, to, you know, at least consider other options. Yeah. To, to, con to reword success problem, we, we like to use that term. If you break down a success problem, it literally translates to, oh no, my game has been too successful. What do I do? Shit, I've sold too many copies of my game. That's, that's the kind of problem you're talking about is if you need to pay your licensing fee. So don't worry about it it's probably going to keep selling once you've made a million dollars off of it. It's probably not going to stop there. Silicon Knights basically got liquidated in court because they made too human with Epic's engine without permission. Maybe they, they didn't pay their licensing fees or they broke the terms of the license. They did a lot of kind of sketchy stuff um, and they got sued into the ground for it. Yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff that goes into to using engines too and i think like especially when you get into console world um and that's probably something that we should cover too um yeah is that when you get to console development you need licenses for that and you need 
development kits and stuff like that. And even though you'll see Unreal and Unity that have the ability to publish to consoles, that's because they have agreements in place with those console manufacturers. Um, and that's why open source engines, you see they can't, like Godot can't publish to any consoles. And that's because to be able to have those libraries in them, um, they're not open source libraries. They couldn't do that and remain open source, which is unfortunate. So it's not impossible. You can write a game in Godot and have it be put onto Switch. It just means you have to go in and get a development kit yourself from the console manufacturers and then adapt your game to run to that software spec, um, which is very complicated and there's not really going to be tutorials on how to do that, which is unfortunate. So if you want to make games for consoles, you kind of want to use an engine that supports it out of the box. Um, but it's a lot of legality that comes into that. And if you just kind of make it and do it, you're going to kind of have to run into issues of what the console manufacturer doesn't like that. They can kind of have issues with, well, how did you get this software development kit? You have to have explicit permissions. And Sony is another one that's very stingy with who gets the kits and who can make games for their stuff for the most part. Um, no, not even just who can make games, but what games those people make can actually go onto the system. Just because you yeah. have a license doesn't mean your game's going to get approved. And Sony was really notorious for that when the first PlayStation came out, because they're trying to control image. They were trying to push PlayStation as... They're trying to push PlayStation as the, the 3D console. Because 3D was the biggest, newest thing at the time. They, they denied a lot of 2D games. Like, a lot of them. I'm just gonna reword that one. Yep. So it's not as not as direct. And my favorite example for this is Stubbs the Zombie. Yep. Because that's that's made on the Halo engine. But uh, um, is... to a to a modern example, there's also uh, Resident Evil Two Remake and Resident Evil Seven and Eight. Yep. Yeah. It's with the Unreal and Unity now. That's a lot less common. People kind of understand that. Game engines are a lot more broad. This was kind of really common back in the day when game engines were very specific. We've kind of hit a new era in game engines. Um, it would probably help if we defined what exactly a game engine is. And That's what we're going to do next. Engine. We're going to go over... Yeah. 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 Game engine, game framework, uh, math library, graphics library, all that kind of the different layers of stuff. Um, but back in the day, because, um, you know, game engines weren't very common. Um... Or not like not co they were common, but not really public knowledge to what they really were. Much about public access to them, especially in like old console days. Um, so there wasn't really much of an understanding. So like the Halo engine and stuff like that, people heard what the Halo engine and Bungie's engine was, but they didn't really understand like what it was. And you know, it was just for Halo games. And then Stubbs the Zombie was made in it, and people were like, "Wait, what?" But Stubbs the Zombie is a third person game but the moment you get in the vehicle you're like oh yeah this drives exactly like the wraiths and the ghosts do in halo and you can tell that it's you know reusing some of that stuff for the way that the game kind of functions in their physics and when you die as stubs you die the exact same way that master chief dies in the original halo and you kind of have an understanding of what an engine is and you're like oh okay that kind of makes sense no it's like yeah it's the kind of base level you know, architecture and collection of software that you use to make the game, and it doesn't actually have to be one style of game. It's just basically a bunch of tool sets that you can use to make games, and you can make other games, and depending on how verbose and how um, how many tools there are in the engine is how kind of unique each game can be, but if it's, you know, a very specialized engine, you'll kind of see what happened with Stubbs and Halo is that, you know, they're very different games, but there is some overlap in their functionality that you can kind of identify. And you would see that a lot in earlier engines uh, with movement, specifically. Uh, like, you could really tell when a game was on the Quake engine versus un earlier versions of Unreal, uh, just based on the movement. The movement was very different. Oh, 3D cameras are yeah. still poop. Yeah, it's, it's 3D cameras. <laughs> 3D cameras are hard. It's, cameras are hard. Yeah. Even 2D cameras. Camera programming is, it blows my mind every time. It is, well, people who, if you're interested in game development and graphics and you haven't done anything with cameras, dive in and, and take a look. It's such a cool concept and it's just, it's wild. Um, just to give a really basic level understanding to how wild it gets, any 3D game you play 
is still technically 2D because you have to take that 3D world and translate it into 2D because your monitor is only 2D. You've only got, you know, X and Y pixels, but you still have to make it 3D. So that's what the camera does. And you have to basically emulate what a camera would see. And at that point, the camera needs to, you know, see 3D objects, but still show them in a 2D world or a 2D plane but you know, still have perspective and everything right. And then you throw lighting in there and you throw shading in there. And it's just, it, it's nuts. It's nuts. <laughs> and you gotta move the camera and then try to move a camera in 3D space and manage it and rotate it and have all that stuff still work well. And then you still have to program stuff. It gets real cool, real, uh, real interesting, real fast. Cause you still have to do everything with like FOV. You still have to do everything with like, you know, exposure, um, you know, how wide you know these angles are going to be you know what's the perspective going to be like you know what angle do i want the camera to be taking light in um, all this other kind of wild wild stuff cameras it's, are much harder than people realize it's an incredibly incredibly difficult thing to do because uh, at the end of the day all your 3d world is is different data structures yeah and it's it's I, one thing I always recommend to people who are interested in game engine development, and I think maybe we'll do another full panel just on what game engine development kind of is and how to get started. Um, but that sounds build fun. A, build a ray ray casting engine and not a ray tracing engine. Yeah, ray casting <laughs> engine. Um, Big difference. <laughs> if you're very interested in ray tracing, um, it isn't too terrible. To, you can do it in a weekend. There's some books out there, and if you message me, I will post them. Um, and it's a really cool topic and it's really interesting. Um, but ray casting is what, uh, Wolfenstein and doom engine originally used to do, um, 3d, but with still kind of 2d tech. And it's super cool to actually go through and see how they did it. Cause it just kind of makes sense, but performance wise, you can run it. Um, and I recently just did a final project for a course, um, which was in Java and I wrote a 2d ray casting or a 3d ray casting um engine but with you know all just 2d stuff um and it still ran they didn't you know run super well but it it could actually still perform and stuff like that and it's kind of interesting how how far you can kind of push it even then you know languages or architecture or limitations that you didn't think you know it would be possible and the real cool thing about it is that there's no 3d at all even though everything looks 3d all your maps are just you know it's a it's a 2d array that you just put certain numbers in basically as the way I did it. Zero is a floor, an empty tile. One is just a wall. And then your ray caster kind of just finds where the player is and casts these rays out. And when they hit an object, so if it hits a one, anything above a one, it then loads what that texture is. And then through there, you just do a little bit of math to see how high the how high the wall is be for the trick that you basically calculate how far away it is. And then from there, you just do some really kind of it's not simple, but it's straightforward um, perspective math. And then you just draw that texture at that height. And then there you go. You have 3D, but it's all just 2D. It's all 2D textures. Everything's 2D. The world's 2D, but it all just shows up as 3D. And it's super cool. Yeah, ray casting is neat. I like yeah. ray casting. Yeah, ray tracing is... Sorry, yeah. ray tracing is like the, the concept is actually fairly simple and like there's a book you can actually do in the weekend the very hardest thing about ray tracing is making it run more than um frames per minute <laughs> which is which yeah. is the main thing yeah we've been um, doing ray tracing for many 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 years that's all those super amazing realistic awesome looking computer graphics that you see in movies that's all ray tracing. That's how they make it look so real and so good. That's why everyone's so excited for ray tracing to be coming to games. Because you can make hyper-realistic environments that can blend into realism. And not even yeah. be noticeable with it. But, when they used it in Avatar even, it was literally 24 hours to render each frame. That means... We've, we've 60 days to render one second of real time. Yeah, it's, it's well, like, we've had ray tracing before rasterization. Um, <laughs> and when you get into graphics programming, you'll kind of see, well, well, because ray tracing, it's, it's you know, you're tracing the rays of light. So it mm -hmm. is kind of the simplest concept. And you're like, 
I have a source that'll capture light and it's going to go, it's not like simple, simple, but rasterization is really cool because you're kind of taking that and being like, all right, well, let's just do a whole bunch of smoke and mirrors and magic tricks to get something that looks like it, but without having to do all the very complicated math. And it's fan, it's, it's an honestly amazing how far we've pushed rasterization to the point where even now that we have ray tracing, a lot of people can't really tell the difference between ray traced <laughs> games and rasterized games. The only real time that, you know, ray tracing will really pop ahead is when you get to reflection. Um, cause rasterization, you know, you can't really do reflection without having to just really kind of cheat it. Um, and we are still super close. There's a lot of really cool things you can do. My favorite, which we could do a topic on is mirrors and video games. I love we've, mirrors. <laughs> we've done we've done subsections of areas just on mirrors where we've talked about some of our favorites, but we can touch on them again because yeah, I love the so, gun through the mirror. <laughs> so like a big thing for, for a mirror is you need to reflect what's on the other side, right? Um, so ray tracing, you can do that no problem because it's going to bounce and you have the angles it's going to bounce on. Um, so you can do some cool, like it'll get like authentic, but with rasterization, you're not going to have that. But what you do with that with the mirror for the most part is you just have it be another room behind it and you just render what the player is there another character on the other side and that's kind of how you would do it or for the most part they would just actually put a camera there and capture the camera input and put it there as well um, which is a bit more performance intensive but a lot cheaper than ray tracing it and you'll see that a lot too and that's kind of how um, portal worked when portal was made the way that you can look into a portal and see somewhere else is that it would take that as a camera and it's not as expensive as you think because co-op games have two cameras at the same time that's kind of just how they work for a split screen um so it's something that's possible so instead of having to trace the mirror you would just put a camera there and then just display whatever that camera sees as that plane there which was cool but now we get ray tracing and then you'll see games that have you know a lot of metallic materials that aren't just like mirrors but you get like it's mostly just the it's very subtle stuff but really kind of adds up for like very subtle reflections but it's amazing how far and how much cool stuff came up with just rasterization. And uh, Spent brings up a re another really interesting point, which is the addition of FPGAs onto GPUs, uh, doing sort of a multi-chip module approach. Like, I know both... A I'm pretty sure NVIDIA's approaching that, but I know AMD's doing it. Yeah. Um, the It will really all come down to the API. Because yeah, like if if you can't get people to adopt the technology, then it's not going to take off. You can have the best hardware in the world if people can't use it to make things. It doesn't matter. Ask I Sega. We're we're hitting a very interesting point in graphics as well, where um, we're we're running into like the physics limitations on a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, and yeah. like the electrons just can't go any faster. <laughs> like we're getting larger and larger screens and resolutions, um, but there is a there is a limit to how many pixels and how like my, the favorite thing that I ran into even is just at a software level. There's a lot of limitations that we can run into. Like when I was making my final project for my class I was in, which was my 2D raycaster. Um, this screen is a 2D array, and I had to I had to write a it was a pain in the ass. I had to write a renderer. And my rendering, when you write a rendering, I'm sure, Spent, you've done this as well, is that, you know, you take the screen size, the easier way to do it is to take it as a 2D array, and then every index is just a pixel on the screen, and you can just write the value for that, you know, 0 to 255 if you don't have any alpha, which you typically won't anyways, because there's going to be nothing behind it to show unless you have you no know, multi-layer buffering. Um, but you just take the whole screen as a 2D array, uh, but sometimes you can just do it as a 1D array, because it makes it kind of a lot easier to access everything. Uh, but the limitations I ran into with Java is that Java <laughs> uses signed ints for their <laughs> indexing, which means that... I knew that was coming. <laughs> you, have, you have an actual code limitation to how much you can do, which I think was... Um, it should be like two, 2 billion, I think. Unless that's the... Um, yeah, it should be like... 2.1 billion, which seems like a huge number, but when you're working with pixels, that's that's not a whole lot of stuff. Like, <laughs> 4K is what, like, 8 billion pixels or something? Yeah, and like, how much is how much is 1920 by 1080? That's I think that's like just under 2 billion. You have like not much to work with. 
Um, so if you're trying to do anything else, like right there, right out of the gate, you have a limitation that you, you can't have more than that because you can't index any higher than that um, right in the language. So it's like, okay, and I, I ran into that, and I ran into that when trying to load textures because I just translated my textures into a 1D array and I could access the information because that's kind of how ray casting works. You're like, all right, I have this texture that's in 2D space, you know, XY coordinates. I have my world that's in that thing. I need to find the pixel on my texture that matches with the pixel that's going to be on the wall in my world. And I try to index it and it's like, uh, uh, you know, too, too high number for array indexing. And I'm like, well, fuck, I can't <laughs> do a list because <laughs> array indexing is a, it's the fast operator. I can't like, there's only so many data structures you can do. Oh my God. Could you imagine trying to draw it from list? Um, <laughs> well, it, just, it was slow. Like even uh... like, when you get to this point in optimization for game engines, you'll really see how much it matters. So another quick small tangent when I was writing this game. So um, I was doing lighting because uh, one of the things that was part of my assignment for bonus marks is that you needed to have like a day night cycle. Um, so for lighting, what I was doing is like, okay, well, I'll just take all the textures that are going to have lighting applied to it and I'll just darken them. So I'll just reduce the values and they're all and on, on red, green and blue, all of them at the same um, level and that'll darken it, but still kind of maintain the actual, you know, underlying color. Um, and Java's color library has a darken function, which you can pass it a co like a the color object and call darken on it, and it'll darken it. But for some reason, that was slow. It just couldn't perform. It couldn't do it on the pixels it needed. It would drop me to like five to ten FPS, and if I walked closer to it, it got even slower because there was more pixels applying the lighting. And I'm like, all I'm doing is just subtracting color values. At least I thought I thought it was. I don't know what Java's library was doing. And I'm like, oh God. So like at that level, it can get very brutal for like optimizations. What I end up having to do is for lighting, I just drew a black rectangle over the whole screen and then just used alpha masking to fade and hide certain areas of the pixels. So that's what your lighting is. It's just a square. <laughs> and then just hiding it that way rather than having to do it on a, on a texture basis because color well, management I mean, apparently is I love too that slow. clever approach though I do <laughs> the, it worked the, well like I think I posted the video of it and it, yep. it does look like darkness it, it was it was wild it's also similar to like how old school shaders were done like it was it was applied to the to the camera not to game space much easier to do it that way that's how all your UI is drawn to in order to prevent slowdown so I'm going to send you an image deus um which i believe is in this looks like the chart that's in the game art game engine architecture textbook um and it really kind of helps people understand how actual complex um game engines get and the multiple layers that are in them and it's kind of a big diagram but it really kind of shows what a game engine is how the game engine do yeah we can if possible, we'd have to, to zoom in and, and maybe go through. The... Yeah, I'm just sizing it up here a little bit first. Yeah, but there's okay. there's a lot to it. And this isn't obviously every game engine. These are kind of more of the AAA do-everything game engines. But yeah, basically what a game engine is, is it's a collection of software modules and tools that allow you to, to build games. Um, a bit more than a game framework. A game framework will usually be... Um, kind of a software API library that allow you to kind of build games. An example would be like um, SFML, um, X, XDA, XNA, XNA, XNA. <laughs> XNA is a framework really close to more like a game engine, but a game engine is more tool-based. It's more you have a lot of tools, you have a lot of stuff that's you know built on top of frameworks or a collection of frameworks that allow you to, to build a game. It's a lot more kind of parts to it and a lot more kind of collection but it also means you're kind of restricted to what the game engine is using and does. Um, you can't always just pull in a lot more libraries to it, but at the most part, it's a, a solid game engine will have everything you need. Yeah. Um, skeletal animations, online multiplayer oh. section. Yeah, I've, I was just staring at the online multiplayer section going, boy, that's really complicated for such a small piece of the image. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like this, this little tiny area here on this, this is this is online multiplayer. My, that's, my favorite? That's a lot of my, work. My favorite is the etc. under game-specific rendering. 
<laughs> yeah, just etc. There's too much in the top left. They're like yeah. terrain <laughs> rendering, water re simulation, and rendering. And you know, you get the idea. <laughs> it renders your world for you. Fuck off. Fuck off. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, uh, audio. I mean, uh, just just even 3D audio model and DSP and effects is a a, a decent add of work if you if you're gonna do it yourself and make it work well. Collision in physics is just this little tiny six box area. Yeah, that'll give you headaches. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely not like larger sections are are larger. It's mostly just everything here is very complicated. Yeah, um, and profiling and debugging. People totally underestimate and probably won't even build into their engine until their game does something funny that they don't understand why it's doing that, and then go, oh, I figure out what it's doing." <laughs> <laughs> Low-level renderer for materials and shaders, primitive submissions, viewports and virtual screens, static and dynamic lighting, cameras, text and fonts, debug drawings, texture and surface management, graphics device interface. I'm glad they gave it a nice big box within the low-level renderer because this is the part that actually talks to your video card. That part's going to take you a couple months to do all right and get all the things going back and forth proper and debugged and, and monitored and efficient and able to do enough frames that you want to do for your game. Yeah, have fun. A, a, good, a good example for that um, is for Vulcan, at least. Um, and Vulcan's kind of a, a wild example because... Uh, it's A lot of people think that Vulcan's a lot harder when it's not really the case. Vulcan is just... Um, when you're first starting out, it seems very daunting because the hollow world, I think, is like 2,000 lines for the triangle to get it just rendering the triangle and showing up. Um, but the, the, the kind of um, misunderstanding is that, you know, more code means more difficult when really the way that Vulcan works is that it doesn't make a lot of assumptions for you when, when you're using um, OpenGL or DirectX. There's a lot of stuff that's kind of done for you and assumptions are already made for you out of the gate and you don't have to do as much to get you know started and running but what we found later on is that when those original assumptions were made you know limitations were then put in and now it's a pain in the ass to go and um you know undo a lot of that stuff where vulcan's just like i have a whole bunch of flags that you can turn on and off whatever the hell you want but you got to turn them off and on so that hello world that's 2000 lines isn't super complicated code it's just a lot of kind of boilerplate and structure setup. It's like, well, what do I want to turn on? What do I want to turn off? And the cool thing about Vulkan is it's a lot of effort at first, but once you kind of start writing your own libraries or have your stuff written and you have an understanding of Vulkan, you know what you want and you can reuse it a whole lot, um, which is real awesome. And it's very optimized because you get exactly what you want out of it. You don't have to worry about a bunch of extra stuff you didn't need. And that's why we see like insane performance boosts out of Vulkan engines and you know, it's not so always just good. that they're, it's not just that the graphics and the quality is super good. It's just that it's so efficient because there isn't a whole lot of assumptions that were made that were there. And the downside is just, you know, you have to, you know, write all that extra code, but it's not like, you know, super complicated, all whole new understanding. It's just, those are kind of the concepts that are in place for graphics programming. It's just that for the most part, when you do direct X, you're kind of like, all right, set up my context, set up all this stuff. And it just does a bunch of stuff automatically for you. Um, Vulcan won't do that for you. You have to do it yourself, um, which takes a bit of time, but you know it's what you kind of want Linux with that knowledge to game design. <laughs> or, or graphics programming and graphics. Programming. Then, yes. Thank yeah. you. And then, but you it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just so, so optimal. Um, and yeah, if you're, Interested in Vulkan, um, just, just, yeah, dive in it. Try the Hello World. Um, that's the open source on, on GitHub stuff. Just follow along, follow a guide. It's It seems very daunting, but honestly, when you dive into it, you'll kind of see that it, it just kind of makes sense. It's, it's You're just kind of setting stuff up. You're basically just telling it what you want, and then you'll build your loop out of that. And it seems like a lot of code, but when you really kind of get an understanding and start reading through it, you're kind of just like, oh, I'm just setting certain flags and setting up the pipelines and, you know, setting up all this memory stuff. It's a lot of memory management stuff that requires a bit more advanced knowledge, um, but not impossible when you're setting up, you know, swap chains and, and everything like that. You just kind of have to do a lot of it yourself, but it gives you so much power over how you can 
you know, control and, and write things. But that's graphics device interfacing, which it's it's cool. It's it's an interesting topic. Yep, that's why I recommend doing a nice basic 3D draw engine once. Once. <laughs> <laughs> You're never, ever, ever going to make one better than the pros on that one. You're not going to make a Vulcan by yourself. But when you understand what you're asking Vulcan to do, you can save yourself a lot of headache, a lot of crashes, and a lot of crappy situations. Because whereas if you have no idea, you're just going to run a command and it's going to crash because you tried to do something insane, you might if you've done a simple one, understand before you even run that code, like, wait a minute, I'm going to create a million of these things and try to do this all at the same time. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> uh, I just want to address a, a comment I saw too. I know, I know it's a joke, but I have another example for um, when spent death sets, I don't always debug, but when I do, I see out printf. Yep. Um, I'm very much like that as well. And then when I was making that Java game, that's kind of what I was trying to do as well. I'm like, oh, my textures aren't loading properly or something's kind of weird. I'm like, oh, I'll just, you know, put in a print statement to see what happens. Um, and then you start to kind of learn, you know, what you're using. And CC is kind of fine for it. But with Java, when you <laughs> system log or you print, there's a lot more under the hood that kind of will happen. And it will, you know, lock threads. You know, it'll lock something until that message buffer is written. So even if I was just to print a console where the player position is, my FPS drops to like 10 because when that code runs, it has to finish before the next step can happen. Um, unless you thread it, but if you thread it, then you run into timing issues anyways, and then you have four problems when you had one problem. Yeah. Um, so the problems for you. That's how I started, and then I'm like, oh, I'll just print, and I'm like, oh god. So my my even just running the code in debug, like not even having debug stuff, just running the debug version with symbols loaded, I couldn't get more than 30 FPS in a ray casting Doom clone. Um, in Java, and I was like, oh dear god, so I had to end up just writing a full debug module that would basically print a screen all the stuff and print all my debug information in real time um, and draw it so that it's part of like a rendering queue, which adds a little bit of stuff to it, um, but it still is, I have the information there, or would basically write it into memory somewhere, and then when I hit a button, would pause it and dump it into a file, and then I can go and get it, so it wouldn't just kill my FPS during it, so it was it's it's a process. It's it's one of those things where you take traditional programming approaches and then you go into games and you're just like, oh god damn it, <laughs> oh no. Yeah, games are games are different. Yeah, it's it's wild. It's ugh, you you really gotta it's 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 a yeah it's it's I enjoy it, but I can see why it gets it gets frustrating. Yeah, yeah, it's and and you know it's it's like we said it's worth pursuing it's worth researching it's worth learning about it's it's worth doing on basic levels and if it's something you really really love i could be talking out of my ass and you really could make the next vulcan with a big team of people that you gather together someday no, there's, there's nothing love for that from yeah using frameworks like um sultan sanctuary has a custom game engine that was made by one guy um Two. and it runs it runs pretty well no nope. all the programming was done by one person oh shell dragon okay. just did art yeah, so it was the... The game was by um, two, the programming was by one, gotcha. Yeah, yeah so the, the game engine was that with that guy's um, custom game engine. Um, and, like, it it, act, it runs well. And you could see that there was, you know, certain limitations that were that were probably there, but they probably wanted to do certain things, and they are making it for a console, and they probably saw that there was certain limitations, or for whatever reason, that that person has a lot more knowledge than I will ever even pretend to know. Um, and they know that they needed to make it themselves or maybe they wanted to challenge themselves for whatever reason they they did it and they made a very successful game out of it so it's not something that's impossible it's just something that I typically don't recommend for people who need to ask the question if yeah. you typically need to ask if you need to make your own then the answer is going to be no uh, or uh, yeah answer is going to be no if you need to ask if you have the level of knowledge where you know you kind of just know you know what you need and what your understanding is and stuff like that or and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah, this isn't to discourage you from ever pursuing or trying. This is just to make sure you understand what they really are, what they do, and what you might be getting yourself into. Yeah, and if if you're somebody like me, who is more into building the tooling, into building the 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 engine, as it were, uh, that runs 
runs other people's scripts in order to make them into a video game, then yeah, pursue that. It's awesome. It's really hard, but it's awesome. Like I'm, I'm at the point uh, where as soon as I get a little bit of time now, I'm going to be trying to write my own game engine and I fully expect it to break my brain, <laughs> but I love that. So yep. it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Might be naive, but one thing that puts me off of Vulkan is that what I want is a single API like OpenCL for general purpose computing. But general com purpose computing needs are completely different from game performance needs, and they need to be their own thing. General purpose computing will never be what games need to get the FPS they get, and the things games do to get those FPS would not be viable for general purpose computing because you're just going to stress your hardware out. Uh, the, the main thing to keep in, keep in mind for games is that everything is smoke and mirrors. You yeah. know, we're, we're not at the level where we can actually make what's being shown, um, and it's going to be <laughs> very specific to what, you know, the game is actually using when it needs, you know, what models are being used, um, you know, what the lighting is going to be like, all that kind of stuff and there's different optimizations that are there as well on top of that what really kind of boils down into games and that level stuff is just memory management um games are and games are just very massive state machines um and all you're really doing for you know interaction is you're taking this system of states at this given point and then displaying it in a you know 2d context to a screen um, through a camera like through a camera lens kind of kind of ideal um and that's just a very minimal kind of explanation of what's going on. But then depending on what the game, there's a whole lot of stuff that can be going on. And then as you start thinking of things that are like MMOs, it's like, well, you have a whole lot of other players you need to keep in track of. And um, an example, like we've been playing Tarkov and a big issue Tarkov has right now is that they need to um, have all the players on the map at once, but they're massive maps. So it's like, well, what do you a call? Like, what do you, you know, not render and, I'm pretty sure that Tarkov will always render all players on this on the game at once. I've kind of noticed that my FPS drops when there's a lot more players, and they're finding issues now where if you crank your visibility, um, but you can change your LED settings, if you get a sniper rifle with a huge scope, there's certain areas in the map where you can basically look at... Um, there's an area that's basically like a dormitory. There's a bunch of like hallways with doors. And if you're far enough away, it won't render the door, but it'll still render the players. So if a player is standing behind a door, you'll just see them and you can just shoot them through the door. Um, and it's a lot of stuff like that where it's like, sure, it makes sense just to always render those doors, but there's a whole lot of, like, it'd be way there's too expensive a, to always yeah. be doing that. There's in a the cost context of, to rendering those doors every single frame. Yeah, yeah, and you wouldn't be able to do that because you have to think that, well, there's a lot of other doors that are that direction, but also behind the player, beside the player, and all those directions far. And then when you're scoping in, it's like, it's going to be too hard to just, you know, as soon as they scope, all of a sudden load all that information as they're scoping. It would basically mean is the moment you'd look down the scope, your frame would just drop. And that's why I'm excited for things like direct, direct storage. storage. Mode, <laughs> yeah, where we're able to load, load that yeah. stuff real quick. Um, but even then, like, that wouldn't be viable for multiplayer um, because you would basically just have to have this certain hardware. It's, it's a very, very complicated topic. Um, when we're at a part now where games are still just such um, edge cases and specific use cases for each one that we're pretty far away from having, like, you know, open kind of tools for everything. And, like, game engines like Unity and Unreal are close there, but even then you can see that, you know, would you they're go as still very limited. Would you go as far as to say they are edge lords? No. Maybe. <laughs> 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 but like if if you think about even just one very small piece of a game engine that is you know not even necessarily part of the game itself but ray tracing like we were talking about earlier it's all cheating mm -hmm. none it of it is be. actually real because we be. did you you can't do it in real time or anything that approaches real time with the actual math that has to happen. Super clever cheaty math going on there. Enough to make my brain explode. So I'm not even going to look it up because I want to survive long enough to play some more Tarkov later. Yeah, like like look into look into how the RT cores on Nvidia's side actually work and how the how the AMD's way of doing that math on shaders works. 
like it's super 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 cheaty and you'll you'll immediately understand why a game will either run really well on both or only run well on nvidia's hardware <laughs> my my favorite kind of example of to kind of how modern graphics works is you i kind of attribute it to painting um when like watch a bob ross video and watch him from the start it's a blank canvas and he just starts doing a few strokes and you're like okay well you know what's this and then all of a sudden something just clicks in your brain and you see it as a mountain you're like wow you know he did a little bit of smudging at the bottom with some different color paint and now your brain sees it as a mountain and you know he'll get some green and do some shaking and like okay what's that and then after one more stroke all of a sudden you're like oh that's a tree and you know that's nowhere near what an actual tree will look like um if you look at most paintings you know it's nothing close to what it is but our brains are very good at approximating like yeah that's you know we're classifiers so it's like yeah it's yeah fuck it that's a tree you know and you that'll register in your brain and it's the same thing with games like you know, you look even like PS2 area, like none of that stuff is even close to realistic, but our brains are close enough being like, mm, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take it, right? Um, yeah, that's a tree, and especially pixel area, right? Like for some reason, as long as it's certain characteristics of there, we're good. And it's the same thing with lighting, you know, we don't need super realistic lighting. It's like, yeah, okay, it's going to be very kind of pixelated and blocky, but you know, for the most part, it's close enough and our brains are just like, eh, okay, I see it. Yeah, that's, that's lighting and reflections and shadows. We're good. Don't worry about it. And then, unfortunately, eventually you hit a point of uncanny valley where the more realistic you get, the less realistic it feels until you hit perfect realism, which is why photorealism is super hard to do. Um, but it, it really is just, you know, fake it till you make it. And our brains are just very good at being tricked in that way. And that's why, you know, paintings have been so popular of all human culture. It's 2D, 3D perspective, doesn't look realistic really at all, even you know, hyper-realistic oil paintings, if you compare, you know, a person standing right next to it, the lighting and everything is completely different, but our brains don't really care. You know, it's close enough for them. Yeah. The, the artistic direction is mainly used in order to mask the imperfections and prevent that uncanny valley part so that we perceive it as a, an art form rather than reality, because we can't do reality yet. We just, we can't. There's, there's too much to tell us it's not real, that it just starts looking fake. And that's why the RTRT is such a big deal. That yeah, starts making the truly realistic environments. And even then, it's still super cheated, which is oh, yeah, yeah. about it. <laughs> I was <laughs> going to say, like, not necessarily realistic, but realist-ish. <laughs> yeah. Getting better. Getting closer. Obviously, we're not there yet. It takes steps. Eventually, we'll improve this RTRT tech, I'm sure. It's the yeah, new yeah wave. Val. Um, my favorite example for that, um, it's not, I guess, too old, but for mirrors and stuff like that, they typically just render the character model on the other side. It would just be another room. Um, and they'd probably put a bit of metallic translucent material in front of it to kind of make it look like a mirror. Um, I'm pretty sure it was Dead Island was the last game I saw this in that did that. And what would happen with a lot of those games, if you walk up to the mirror, stand right next to it, and stick your gun into it, the gun would stick out of the mirror at you too because it's just another player model and they wouldn't uh, occlude it because that's you know a bunch of math they kind of have to do to know when to stop rendering a model um they just hope people wouldn't walk up to a mirror and do that and it was fucking hilarious you walk up and you're like oh my character's gun is sticking out of the wall or sticking out of the mirror at me too and then you immediately understand how they were doing that and it makes sense it's a super cheap way to do reflections yeah it's, it works. it's super low cost and aside from that one tiny little edge case which has no real impact on the game you know why not if you most players just run by the the mirror it's going to be a great effect yeah all right. What, what are the run by, glance at it, and go, "Wow, that they they got reflections working. That's really cool." What What are the two things you've heard people say about engines that we don't have up here? And do we want to actually add some of the write down some of the things that a game engine does? Not like a big AAA game engine, but like a core basic game engine. What are the things it has yeah. to be able to do? Yeah. Or what are the game engine? Uh, too many. Chrome tabs. Uh, we have that up there, kind of. Using a game engine is cheating. And engine X can't do thing Y. Yeah. Similar to shadow mapping. Yeah, every everything's cheating. 
Every time you learn something about how a game engine does something, you're just learning about how they cheated. Yeah, that's engine X can't do thing Y. Literally. <laughs> like, in the exact same format as you've written it. <laughs> we could, I guess, put some examples for some of these so a bit sure. more clear. I'll take this one. <laughs> you haven't read the list. Well, that's an important step. <laughs> hmm? Why? Why are you black and... What? If, what? Why? Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> you just stay Format that a. way. I don't know what's happened, but... You're just adding good examples at this point. Yep. That's okay. Good examples are good. Stencil shadow versus shadow mapping. I love the effects of stencil shadows, but it's not... It's really not scalable. Well, RTRT will fix all that. <laughs> Once it gets good enough. Yep. Yeah, I think a big misunderstanding of the point of a game engine is that it just allows the developer to focus on creating a game. Because there's a huge difference between game engine architecture programming and game development. And we've kind of gone over this a bit before with the differences in game programming versus traditional programming where your game development is state management and behavior programming. You know, you're taking a, making a very big state engine, you're managing all these states, and you're providing an interaction layer to the player to interact with the states of the game and change the states. And that's basically all, all a game is. Um, you know, you have a character that you move, you know, his position's a state, you know, his energy's a state, his health is a state, everything else is a state. Killing an enemy, you know, removes that enemy from the current available enemies, you know, as a state. And then rendering is just taking a snapshot of the current game in its state and displaying it in a, in a context. And there's different contexts that you can do that. And the cool thing about minimaps in games is you typically, um, to make a minimap, um, you can just render the current game from the top-down perspective, but just in a different graphical context. Um, I've done that for a driving game I'm doing right now. I just render a camera on top, but instead of rendering all the textures and everything, I just render it as blocks. You know, take the same map data, take the same player location data, render it as just different objects. That's because they're doing a lot of cheaty math in order to figure out where things are. Sometimes you're going to get strange ed cases. Yeah. Ooh. Me mechanics oh, i need to so, find this yeah let's yeah i was gonna say let's let's touch on what rubido just said I, i've never heard anyone say that and if i did i would chastise them um you've heard people say this multiple times so i feel it has to be addressed following guides on how to make mechanics is bad how the hell are you supposed to learn there's there's a huge not a huge but there's a quiet or a quiet no, there's a loud minority of people who want you to just brute force it and figure it out on your own for some reason instead of collaborating. And a lot of these people don't realize that a lot of people in the game industry meet up at these conferences to share how they came up with these mechanics and these ideas. These aren't like closed IP things. They want people to, like, they love sharing how they came up with certain things and how they did certain things. And game mechanic programmer is a um, full title. Um, combat designer is a full title. There's people whose job it is to just create just the combat systems inside of games inside of game engines. Um, FromSoft is masterful at this, and you can see how important it is to have good combat designers and good combat programmers. I mean, yeah, okay, Dark Souls 1, there are some hitboxes that'll piss you off because they had to cheat a, a ridiculous amount to make hitboxes work in Dark Souls on a PS3, okay? The fact that that and game could work on a PS3 worse, at all is amazing. The Xbox 360. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Like, if, if they're making it for this hardware, the fact that they got those hitboxes as accurate as they did is staggering. But when you get to stuff like Bloodborne and Sekiro and Dark Souls 3 and whatnot, those hitboxes are amazing! And the fact so, that they could keep the frames up and, and keep that action up and be that accurate with everything is just staggering. Um, I just posted a link to Game Mechanic Explorer, um, and I love this um, utility. It uses the, the phaser game framework, which is a JavaScript one. 
Um, and basically what this site does is it has a drop down menu on the left and it just has examples of some mechanics and then it gives you a, a, a interactable um, ver version of it as well as the source code just below it um, with comments on how it's done. And it teaches you how to make these. These are very basic mechanics. I have a resource somewhere, I'll check my, my bookmarks, that's like this but with a huge library of game mechanics and a bunch of basically a bunch of people who go through and try and open source certain game mechanics and recreate them um, and allow people to, to reuse them and stuff like that um, which is which is real cool um, the nice thing about this one is they also have stuff for ray casting and shadows and lighting which is a very complicated topic and it's really nice to have it broken down with a clear example of kind of how it is um, and how you can do it Yeah, I, I was actually thinking maybe we can put some granular things down too, just to give a sense of scope. And this is another great uh, uh, utility as well, um, Game UI database. Um, it's just a collection of all the games basically ever, and it's just all their interface menus and all their buttons and stuff like that. So if you, you can use them as inspiration, you can kind of compare them and see the decisions that people have made. It's There's a lot of kind of fantastic resources out there. Let me actually record collection. these for people in the future. I don't know why it's doing this to me. <laughs> <laughs> Spent death. Have you seen the uh, the non Euclidean space engines that exist? Because they're uh, they're what's, wild. What's the one that's like came out in I want to say twenty eighteen. 2017 maybe it was one of the first non non euclidean games that people did i i have it i gotta find it i remember recommending it to to deus but it's a very short game i have way very very brain games. breaking love it it's gonna go like this just copying it from here fix my copy paste yay Apparently it's copying formatting from my HTTPS stream chat. Oh yeah, capture. the perspective inside. I have that game. I can't remember what it's called. I hate my memory. Oh, you were you were talking about that just like three or four panels ago. Yeah, I'm just gonna scroll through. My, <laughs> just let me look little, through my history. Just give me a minute. I've got I've got too many games. This is a problem. Um, is it though sub subliminal yeah, super oh. liminal super liminal super liminal is awesome yeah i love that one i've recommended I, that one to a few <laughs> different people i broke that game but i love it <laughs> i found out that you can if you time it you can grab an item look down and jump and let go and you'll just constantly because of perspective you know keep it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger so i just use that to like cheese my way out of the maps and cheese my way <laughs> everywhere it's like <laughs> I have I have ladders wherever I want to go, but it was still I still really enjoyed it. It was still super cool. Uh, really enjoyed that game. Yeah. So I yeah, Th the theory that someone could say following guides is bad. It it makes me physically mad. I would like to pummel this person. Yeah, I'm not a little guy either. Where are you? Yeah, got got a preface. for some the game development community is a fantastic community but like unfortunately most communities there is a bit of a dark side to it there is a lot of gatekeepiness that happens um there's a lot of elitism and that just kind of happens with just any hobby in any world nowadays but it just seems to be kind of prevalent in programming and game making whatever and for the most part the reason why i kind of see this is that a lot of people tie their identity to their hobby or their identity to this and then they feel challenged, you know, when it all of a sudden becomes easier or more people start doing it. So then they kind of want to just put other people down because they want to be the ones who, you know, do it or they want to be the ones who do it right. And they have to find a way to do that rather than just being happy that other people are, you know, sharing the same interests or sharing the same hobbies. And, you know, you don't have to be that doesn't have to be what makes you unique. You know, you can do unique things with it to stand out, but that doesn't just have to be your main part of identity. <laughs> Pseudo is the game breaker. Yeah, that's that's an accurate name for him. And I 100% agree with you. Pseudo. Look, look, guys. I don't. I'm sorry your ego gets in the way, or or whatever it is that makes you think this way. But the only way that game design and game development grows as a hobby and as a 
thing in general is if we include as many people as we can into it and get as many ideas put into it as we can. Guides are a baseline. That's where you start. This is how it's done now. If you don't have a baseline, you cannot tell how good what you're doing is. It's like monitoring a network or anything. If you just grab a snapshot and go, is this good? You have no idea. You have no idea what the standard is, what the normal is, what it's supposed to look like. You need to know. And the only way to do that is to figure out where everyone else is at already. To do that, you do guides. And then you improve. And that's how we get to ahead as a community. Okay? Stop gatekeeping. Yeah. And it's it's something, unfortunately, I, I can speak of because I, it was something that I went through when I first went game development. You know, you just... It gets part of your identity and we're one of the only people that's, that knows it. Um, but it's just it's just better off doing it. And I think I brought the example before. I went to a game jam and we just tried making our own game engine for whatever reason. And, you know, we made an engine, but we didn't make a game. <laughs> so it kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, and then going forward, it's, you know, it happens. And if you know people like that, you don't have to, don't conf confront them about it really. You know, just let them figure it out on their own eventually that, you know, that's not the way things will be. You can say, hey, that's not cool. Um... But people learn eventually, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, once they learn what they don't know, they'll kind of realize like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm not, I, I need to, I need to step back and actually learn a bunch of stuff here. And, and, you know, just people don't need to listen learn to some them. humility. Yeah, just don't listen to them is the main thing. You can just let them say and do whatever they want, but just know that, you know, if you're making games, that's the end of the day, you know, you're making games. It doesn't matter what you're doing or how you're doing it. As long as you're, you know, end of the day, the point of it is it's making a game. Yep. Having fun enjoying yourself these are key these are key let's add gamma sutra that is a good site yeah i've got lots of articles for them saved yeah i always enjoy browsing them enter there we go what no what are you doing there you go <laughs> <laughs> I'm, How does I'm Google getting, Docs work? <laughs> I'm getting along very well with Google Docs today. <laughs> yeah, I, I can write my own text editor easier than I can use theirs. That's just... Just accept it. Uh, where, where, where do we got? 537. What do we want to touch on for game engines? Um, we can say, you know, what game engines should you use for what, you know, situations and provide some recommendations or... If, people have any questions about any game engines or if people you know want a suggestion for a game engine for an idea that they have we can do that there you go some engines we like slash when to use them um i guess the, the main thing if you're first starting game development or even just programming really in general which a lot of people kind of um, you know, a lot of people when they start first making games, they're also first starting to learn programming, and a lot of them don't understand that they're kind of completely not completely different, but there are different um, disciplines. Um, if you're learning programming, you're not learning game making, and if you're learning game making, you're not really learning programming. Um, but you do need to know both to be able to make games, which is uh, not necessarily actually because you can use something like Construct, but it, it helps. Um, but my recommendation, at least if you're fresh, you don't know programming and you don't know game making really in an engine context to, um, use something like, um, if you want to learn the programming, then use something like unity or even something like game maker to get started. If you want to just start making games cause you have an idea and you want to just have a, a UI to do it, something like construct is helpful. If you want to make like an RPG style game, RPG maker is fine. You can do something like that. Um, game maker is got a pretty straightforward and basic scripting language with it that it's kind of really helps you um, step into the programming world um, a thing that people forget usually when they start shitting on you know game engines for the languages that they have is that you know they have a prior knowledge of programming and they forget what it was like when they first started programming and they're like what the hell is an int you know what's a bool what the hell is a class you know these are all things that took time to understand the concepts for and you know um, especially when someone's learning a game or wants to make games, they're not really going to have to care about that at the start. And it's going to be a bit confusing for them because they're going to be like, well, why do I care about if something's private or public when I just want to make a character move on my screen? 
Um, and then for in, in actual game making, it doesn't actually really matter at the start either because you're not making ex re accessible libraries and, you know, it's most stuff is self-contained anyways. Um, so there's a lot of kind of um, different edge cases for that. But if you're starting off, you know, Unity Game Maker, um, research stuff like that, kind of whatever comes up. If you wanted to make an RPG game, you want to make like a Final Fantasy clone, RPG Maker is fine. It gets a lot of heat for whatever reason. I think it's just because a lot of RPG Maker games went onto Steam and then people got salty about it for whatever reason. But I mean, if they're games and they're fun and unique, there's Indeed. people who just have a unique concept and they can just utilize what's there. I think a lot of the backlash for RPG Maker is uh, due to the quality of the games that were put out, because a lot of them were not... I mean, like, Valve doesn't vet the games that go on Steam. They don't. So it's... Uh, a lot of the problems are tied to the fact that they're not necessarily high quality games. They're not necessarily thought through, but that is not down to the engine that's down no. to the people who made the game garbage in garbage out but yeah. that is also reflected in the price of these dollar 15 games so if you paid dollar 15 for a game and you expected to get a final fantasy quality clone um give your head a shake <laughs> that's what and i gotta uh, say to that one <laughs> another thing to touch on with things like unity and game maker is you get uh you get language ergonomics that are much much easier to to grok when you're just learning uh like learning c sharp for instance is much 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 easier than learning c or c plus plus yeah and game maker um and even something like godot will have script will have dynamically typed scripting languages built into them where you don't have to really worry about learning all the types. You know, when you're doing just game behavior scripting, it really doesn't really matter too much. And those languages are designed in a way to kind of auto-optimize um, in a sense of to, you know, what you're actually going to be trying to using. And then you can just focus on on behaviors. You know, you'll just be using, you know, variable this is equal to this. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to worry about what type you're doing. Um, and then C Sharp is a strongly typed but it has a lot of dynamic support which is kind of interesting um but and you can great still just language do, ergonomics like yeah, you can still just do var thingy and just let it figure itself the figure it out but then you still have the ability to explicitly define and restrict things if you want if if i were in a position where i had to do some general purpose programming and it needed to be multi-platform i would honestly probably do it in c sharp now that mono is a thing yeah, and and then outside of games, like even .NET Core is is pretty cool, but Mono is Mono is pretty fantastic too, and that's what Unity uses is is, is Mono. So stop crafting yeah. on Unity too, please. Yeah, there's actually been some phenomenal games come out on Unity. Yeah, uh, Valheim, I believe, is Unity. Uh, Lua is a standard for game front end scripting. It has been for a long time because it works. It's fast. Yeah, it's very fast. hate that it's one indexed. <laughs> That's Whatever. About it. You'll find it's, that you'll it's find not that like it's a major a limit lot. for game UI. There's no, a lot it's of just annoying. <laughs> you'll find that when you get to a lot of scripting languages, there's always just something weird that they just do, and you're just like, eh? okay. Um, yeah, Lua is Lua has been standard for a long time. Um, there's some some certain reasons why it's not used in a bunch of game engines now, but it's very heavily used for plugin programming and game modding libraries and module support yeah huge um, in modding and i think it's just the sensibility it has uh, but i think it's a lot of engines will kind of do a bit more custom scripting stuff just because um, it allows them to do a lot more optimization stuff under the hood um, for you know what the architecture needs but lua is fantastic for in-game scripting and behaviors and something that you know gary's mod has been using for for a very long time and a lot of Final stuff, but like moddings and stuff like that. A lot of modding community, they'll have it just be kind of plug-in architecture. Of like you just script it in Lua and we load it in and run it. Yeah, WoW's front end is still all LUA. Yeah, it's it's got it's got its issues and there's limitations to it, which is why it doesn't always make it into the full behavior scripting language because you won't be able to do a lot of the behavior stuff. But when it comes to plug-in support and modding, where it's like, okay, we need to just run some behavior, run some script 
you know, we can just do it right then and there. It's not going to be too much of a problem. But as long as there's not a whole lot at the same time going on. That's why the MMOs run LUA as the front end, because then each piece of the front end for the display for the person can be a component that they can turn off and replace with a different component if they want to display information. Super customizable UIs, since MMOs are literally just about information. That's all they are. Sims. Yeah, they're they're uh, even if you're doing live combat with like in the twenty five and forty man team days when I used to do that, it's it's all about just having all the information in front of you. How much health does everyone have? How much health does the boss have? How much, how much cooldown is left on everything? That's that's what you need to make your decisions. Yeah, you'll Erlang is sick. Yeah, you'll Sorry. find with, with, with <laughs> Lua, but you'll find with a lot of scripting languages that you're not really going to get much concurrency. You're not really going to get any threading. Everything will kind of just run on a thread, um, but engine architecture can can handle that because you can still utilize you know multiple os threads to run certain things with it and you know handle individual lua states for that purpose which is why it's kind of good for modding and plugins because each plugin you know will then you can set up the architecture that way Um, but you'll see that a lot in just a lot of scripting languages anyways and that's just because that level of management and language management isn't always you know kind of baked in yeah, and it's not even necessarily what you want. No, uh, like Spent now is bringing up Erlang in the context of using it in a game engine. Uh, Erlang would actually be horrible for a game engine. Like the the things that Erlang is made to be able to do, and specifically the Erlang VM, are not what you're looking for in a game engine. Uh, in a game engine, you want to be able to cheat. You want to be able to move fast. You want to be extremely performant. Whereas Erlang's goal has always been scalability and stability. Like you, the, it has an entirely different goal than something uh, that you would use to build a game engine in. And it's the same reason why you're only just now starting to see some people dabbling uh, in game engines in Rust. Now, if you would like to build your game server in Erlang, we can talk. Then I would say do it in Elixir instead. <laughs> it still runs on the Erlang VM, but it's a much easier to use language. You do need to understand functional programming, but it's it, Elixir is actually sick. Like it's yeah. a sweet, sweet language. Yeah, but um, but for that that sort of a, a model, yeah, you're you're more looking at the server where it just wants to make sure the information's right all the time and and speak out and take it data in. That's. <laughs> That's it. It's a nice little box. Real Engine 4 slash 5. Yes. I love, love what the AAA studios have done with Unreal Engine. <laughs> love to see them actually using it. Man, oh, those came out great. <laughs> Unreal Engine 4 fifths, though. <laughs> Stop assuming. See, it's not just me that can't use Google Sheets. Google Docs, whatever they call it. Um, yeah, yeah, whatever they call it. Um, yeah, Unreal Engine <laughs> um, is fantastic. I'm not very good at Unreal Engine. I'm hoping to get a lot better. I've been working with. I'm going to start working with with Egg on on his. On he his knows project. Unreal. Yep. Yeah, he I'm knows gonna, Unreal I'm really to well. to learn a whole lot, a whole lot from them. Looking forward to that. I've I've dabbled a little bit in it before, um, but it is very powerful and gets complex very quickly. Um, their blueprinting is very cool. Um, a very powerful tool. You can make full games with just blueprints. Um, it, you can kind of dig yourself into a bit of a hole that way and when you go back to maybe do some optimizations. But if you're making your first game, you know, game making is just a series of barriers and walls that you need to get over and get through. Um, and the, as many of those that you can remove at the start, the better. Because you can always, you know, go back and relearn and redo um, at a later time. But what seems to happen, and you'll notice this a lot of the industry too, a lot of people who try to learn is eventually you'll hit some wall that just causes you to lose that motivation and lose that interest. And it's so hard to get that back and push forward. And it's why a lot of us just walk away and can't do it. And as many walls as you can remove at the start means that you have a higher chance of successfully getting through all of them eventually and getting into, you know, making the game and getting to that point. Making games is a puzzle game. <laughs> I like that one. I mean, yeah, it, it kind of is. It is. Yeah, it totally <laughs> is. That's why I like it. It's it's so accurate. You're just constantly uh, assaulted by different complex puzzles. You're like, how do I solve this? 
How do I solve this? And somehow when you've done it all, a game happens and nobody knows how. <laughs> what you always tell people. I love it. I love it. I may steal it. I'll give you credit when I do. That's the, the best part of all software development. Getting to solve a complex thing. That's that's not just development in IT. That's a lot of different stuff in IT. Just just problem solving. Problem solving is fun. Yep. It had a lot of the same stuff like trying to figure out network issues and server issues and you know, all of a sudden you figure you realize what's going on, you're just like oh, I get it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Just any problem solving really really ends up functioning though. Construct slash game maker. Okay, we had game maker above as well, but that's cool. Game maker gets two shouts. I'll just do construct. Um, <laughs> I wanted Fuck just to do in the context. Maker, you one. Um, <laughs> uh, Very similar. Yeah. Uh, the main thing is if you don't want to dive into programming and just want to dive into getting into making games, it's kind of a good start. As the the criticism I always lever at a lot of games, just let me do the thing. And Construct just kind of lets you do the thing. Yeah, that's the same with RPG Maker and all that stuff too. You don't have to write any scripts. You kind of just choose boxes and choose stuff. So, um, mean making yeah. games can be fun. Yeah, because that's how I got started in when I was like 14 or 15 was with Construct and then with RPG Maker and eventually I want to start them to branch out more and that's when you start getting, you know, then you have a motivation to learn the scripting and you have a thing you want to make and then you have something you want to Google and that's kind of just how that process is going to learn. It's really hard to learn programming when it's just, you don't know what you want to make and you just have to follow a tutorial. You're not going to grasp it as much as having something you want to make and then following a tutorial that makes it so you have that thing you wanted you'll have a lot better time because it can get very frustrating very quick, especially when you hit the compile button and you just get errors. You're like, wah! That's, yeah, that's cool. especially yeah. when they're linker errors and you're just like, what does this even mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Having an idea of what you're trying to do is is very, very important. I've got, I've got a story from when I was in post-secondary that I always remember. I only know the guy as Panic Guy. That's all we're going to say. That's still the only name I remember, so you're safe, panic guy. But I tried to help him a few different times. He always sat next to me in programming. And there was one time, um, th this, this is literally what, he, what I saw when I looked over at him. That literal, literal expression, like hands in the hair, head down, just staring at his keyboard. And I felt bad. And I just looked, okay, okay, what are you trying to do? And he just looked at me and said, I don't know. I didn't know how to help him. This was this was programming 101. He he probably shouldn't be in programming, and he, I don't think he continued with programming after that. It it wasn't his thing. But yeah, just just know what you're trying to do. That's that's the biggest thing. If you've got a set goal and you know what you're trying to achieve, you will eventually get there. Just get that goal clear in mind. Work towards it. Much easier when you have a goal. Nightmares of debug context switch errors. Yep. I had to deal with one of those not too long ago. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I did get it working. And when it all worked, it was, aha! And now that test runs every day. No more flaking. Yay. I mean, it still fails, but it's uh, environment failures, not test failures. So <laughs> that's not on you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's good.
Do we have any final questions? Did we not cover anything? Is there anything unclear to anyone? And if you're watching this in the future going, yeah, 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 I have a question. If you're on YouTube, leave it down below. We check it all the time. We'll answer it. And if not, jump in our Discord, which can also be found below, and ask us. It's all it takes. We answer questions. We would absolutely love to have you join and ask questions that we can either help answer or uh, or find information to help you answer yourself. Yeah, yeah. If at the very least, we can point you towards the resource. We're n we may not know everything, because there's way too much to know. <laughs> there's way so many too things. much to know. <laughs> way too much to know. But we know where to find it all. Google Foo is strong. Yep. Yep. I've I've legitimately taken a class on how to search Google. It's a mandatory part of my BCIT classes. It's a very important thing to know too. Like when I when I'm interviewing for for different engineering positions, one of my go-tos is always like, you know, show me how you find information. I'm going to throw you into this weird problem solving context with my my question. Show me how you go get information to solve it. That's definitely a good one. That's definitely a good one. I always point out, kind of, kind of half jokingly, because you're also trying to build rapport. But I always manage to include at some point. I'm really good with Google. It's important. Yeah, got to be able is. to get information. Yeah, nobody can be expected to know everything. You've got to be able to find information on the fly. And that. Pretty much, pretty much good. Then, nobody else had questions. Just nightmares. Yeah, the game engine, game engine architecture is hard. I have an entire repo is filled with half-finished game engines, <laughs> <laughs> multitude of different languages. <laughs> Not many games. A lot of game engines. <laughs> All right, I've got pizza on the way, so I'm gonna go eat that. You guys up for some scav runs and then maybe some pew pew? And if we get tired yeah. of clicking on things, maybe we can click on things in Risk of Rain 2 as well. I'm always <laughs> down for some Risk of Rain 2. Yeah, I, I might be a bit, because I just woke up right before I had some stuff I need to take care of. I don't know what happened. I slept for a long time. What um, happened is you played Tarkov until 6 a.m. Yeah, that happened. But then I went to sleep. I thought I was going to... I set an alarm for like 12, and then body was just like, nah, dude, you... You need this. Nah, you're you're sleeping till three thirty. Well, yeah, I woke up at three thirty, and I'm like, oh. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to sleep more. <laughs> I went to bed earlier than you, Ow. and I set an alarm for noon, and I woke up at two. So, it's, um, Tarkov is pain, but Tarkov is life. It's it's I got a lot of problems. I have a I have I, I usually Whoa. have a hard time recommending it. It wasn't Brutal. until yeah, yeah, it wasn't until. Uh, they fixed scav runs really like scav karma system has made that scav runs are a lot of fun um, I hope that they just reduce the cooldown on that eventually um, It's got a cliff of a learning curve um, And I hate telling people like oh eventually, you know, it gets fun But it's kind of one of the things if you're someone who likes to put a bunch of time into a game and get a lot out of it um, It's one of those games where there's just so much depth to it and there's always something to do um, and it's 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 pretty brutal, but also very very rewarding. It's one of those games where if you like to learn from your mistakes and then eventually be very powerful from doing that, it's one of those games where you start off basically no idea what's going on, you're just getting kind of stomped, and then the more you pay attention to what mistakes you're making, eventually you are the one that's just kind of doing the stomping, and you it's a it's very very rewarding. It reminds me most of the old school MMOs from the full global PVP loot or uh, corpse stealing days. Cause that is exactly how it plays. It's an FPS MMO with a limit of eight people on a, on a map. And if you get killed, you lose everything. And if you kill them, you take everything they had. Yeah. Eventually um, their plan <laughs> is, is once the maps are done, it is just going to be one open world. They are all going to link together, which is going to be very interesting. Um, at least that's their plan. I don't know how well... It, we'll see if that actually happens. <laughs> and you will able to handle it. I actually like the kind of raid stuff because I like just having a match that I can jump in. You know, if I want to do 15 to 20 minutes, I can do a smaller map. You know, I can get in, get out. I don't have to... And that's one thing I always hated about DayZ is that 
you know, you go up north and you die, and you're like, well, fuck, now I'm all the way back at the fucking beach noob shore, and it's a 40-minute walking simulator to get back to where I was, or I gotta refine everything. It's, it's a lot more, like, once you, like, level up to get to, like, flea market, it's a lot more action-oriented, where you just go in, try to kill people. If you kill people, you get their shit, you sell it, make money. If you die, you go out, you buy, you, you put, your, put your next gear set on, go right back in and try and do it again. It's a lot more fast-paced, where it's, like, you don't have to... You know, like most survival games, run for 40 minutes and re-gear from scratch. You can have a bunch of stuff already ready for it, and you can kind of just do it. Yeah, it's it, it's definitely not going to be for everyone. Uh, I think I'm going to enjoy it. I think it's going to help me get better at FPS, too, because I'm going to die fucking fast and lose everything. <laughs> so, we're just kind of, one thing they need to fix and balance is just the... Well, they can't really do it too well, either, is the... Um, the, the the gap between player levels like with most mmos you can kind of you know keep new players in a certain area and keep high level players in a different area where this game it kind of overlaps a lot and you kind of get stomped pretty hard like there's not too much you can do until you figure out that you can just shoot them in the legs um, <laughs> but now for, we know to for, shoot them in for, the legs <laughs> for for players um there's not like well, i mean there's there's labs in certain maps that only high level players will go to um but it's not, like, it's, but that's kind of the whole point is when you eventually get to the high level, you kind of just want to go and, you know, stomp on the, on the low levels. But a lot of people eventually get bored of that. But we're kind of in that unfortunate part where we're a couple, it's a fresh wipe and we're a couple of weeks or a month or so into it. So there's a lot of people who are now kind of getting that mid-tier gear, but not high-end gear. So they're still kind of going near the noober, low-level areas. And then if you're fresh to the game, you have, like, a pistol and you're like, Oh god, here comes a guy with a full armor set and a full auto drum mag and I'm scared. <laughs> but it's it's part of it. It'll get your blood racing, but it feels so good if you manage to shoot that guy in the face and take all of his shit. And then like me, you just sit with it in your inventory being too scared to use it. <laughs> but you just look at it being like, I remember when I killed that guy. That's I the remember thing. I, I like fun for five minutes <laughs> and why they really don't need to separate the areas as hard because in an MMO the high level in a low level area, he could probably kill a hundred of them without even flinching. Like they literally don't stand a chance against the guy. You do stand a chance against the high level guy. He can miss his shots. You can play it safe. You can get through his armor. You can shoot him in the legs. If he doesn't have a face mask, you can just get that face shot and fucking kill him. There, grenades, there are ways to beat him. Grenades. Grenades are a gren lovely yeah. answer to armor. That is they'll just kill kill whatever so it's not impossible like i've killed i was playing with zeal yesterday and i killed a level 50 um when we're calling up the cliff i shot him in the face and killed him but he had a buddy and then unfortunately when i peeked him i peeked him wrong what i should have done was thrown a grenade so i was trying to learn what i was doing i should have just threw grenades down the ditch at him but i peeked and he shot me in the face but you know if i would have to survive there if i would have killed his buddy too zeal and i would have just had some really sick gear and we could have just extracted Yep. Yeah, I, I'm kind of in the same boat as you need, Lack, where there's just a little too much downtime for my taste, a little too much slowness to the game. Uh, but what I'm going to do is talk to these two and just be like, hey, let's ignore gear fear. Just grab a gun. We're going to go murder some people. I don't have gear fear. I don't give a shit. I yeah, played I Dark Souls. To... I'm used to losing 50,000 souls. It's no big deal. Yeah. I, just, <laughs> I just need to hit level um level 20 and i'm almost there and then i can just pump us with with meme guns i can buy the drum mag for the ppsh and that's a hilarious <laughs> gun because it's cheap as fuck and we just go in with th <laughs> we'll throw some attachments on it and then we'll just hold left click and charge and we'll just see what happens put as many flashlights as possible and then go <laughs> turn on all the flashlights and go in at night yeah Anybody with night vision will just be like, what the fuck? <sighs> so we don't, this, we're, we're not actually planning on playing like the game, so to speak, as they uh, kind of intend you to play. We're just going to go in and meme and have a great time. But we are going to win through this because we do tend to be better than the average gamer. So when we play a game a lot, we, we find ways to win. Even if it's the ways we're making it fun, we'll still find ways to win that way. <laughs> <laughs> just try the grenade meta. I would love to see that and just bring. Ah, yeah, I'm uh, down grenades. with the grenade meta. Just get really well, good at the grenades as one and just blow down, everyone up. 
Everyone just spams G until everything, including ourselves in the room, has exploded. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine shooting one guy and then they just throw like the three buddies with them, just throw 15 grenades all around them? <laughs> and we got to do it on the tiny map. <laughs> Go in there, the tiny map, nothing but grenades and knives. <laughs> like factory and just throw grenades everywhere around the factory constantly. I think you can i th i think i don't know if it was an intentional thing or a glitch but i think if you go to throw a grenade and then like change your weapon it would glitch and get stuck in you and people <laughs> would get pissed because it would blow themselves up but you can use this as a productive measure if they're holding a point and then you're just like okay guys i'll see you on the other side <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right. We're gonna go eat, and we'll come back and play some games in a bit. Yeah. Time to go meme. meme time on to, people. Time to go meme. We'll also do some insurgency, most likely, because we can only do uh, Tarkov for so long, and maybe something else. Who knows? But until then, I'm Deus. I'm Rage, and I'm Pseudo. May all your shots be headshots. <laughs>